the church today is confused about divorce. And that's because it's confused about marriage. And that's because it's confused about love. And Hollywood is not helping. Sean Connery said that there is a group for men in Hollywood called Divorce Anonymous. And if any of its members starts to get the urge to get a divorce, they send an accountant over to talk him out of it. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, Jaimon Hansu, he, is, he was in Guardians of the Galaxy and also in Captain Marvel. He said, seriously, some of the reason why you have so many divorces is that we tend to get married for others, for how it looks to others. Now, can you imagine building a, a relationship, a marriage, simply on how you think it will look to others? That, that's not a very good foundation. And then finally, one more sage bit of wisdom from the very wise person known as Gru's mom in Despicable Me 3. Um, she told him that shortly after she was talking to Gru, she said, shortly after you and your twin brother were born, your father and I divorced, and we each took one son with us. Obviously, I got second pick. Oh! What a terrible thing to say. <laughs> he has a very special relationship with his mom. I don't know if you've seen those movies or not. But seriously, let's go on. Let's see what Jesus says. Okay, so we know what Hollywood says. What does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 to 32. And we're continuing on in the series, Next Level Relationships. So far, we've talked about anger and lust and how those affect your relationships. They negatively impact your relationships. And as just speaking of which, uh, as a follow-up to last Sunday's message, there is still time to join our NFC group in Accountable to You, Accountable to You group. Uh, so text me if you've already got my cell number, just shoot me a text or email me. You can go to, to our website or nfc.church and look up who we are, the team, and you can email me easily through there. Just say, hey, I want to be a part of that. Prevention is key. Prevention is key. Everybody say that together. Prevention is key. That's right. That's good. But much rather prevent than clean up afterwards. It's much harder. Today, as we continue on in the series, I want to talk to you about divorce. What does God say about divorce? But that will not make sense until you know what God says about marriage. So let's get some biblical principles to help us answer those questions. And once we find those answers, I want to look at, so then what do we do as believers, of, as followers of Jesus with that info, with those answers? So before I even dive into what the Word of God says, I want to tell you just a little bit about my context. The people that I love the most and I care about the most, many of them are divorced and remarried, remarried. family members and friends that I love. So I care about them very much. And uh, with some, some of those people, like family, I walked through those, uh, those divorces and those remarriages. And so I, I have seen the pain that comes. And, and so often, um, the reason a divorce comes is because there's already been a lot of pain. So tons of pain. And then looking for relief from that pain uh, divorce is sought, and then that brings more pain. No matter how you slice it, it's painful. It's painful for the kids, for the family, for the friends, for those who go, go through it. It's, and so I want you to know I have a lot of compassion for those who have gone through a divorce. And the fact that you are serving Jesus today, I say, yes, good job, keep going. That means you have overcome a lot to get to this point. And I know that God loves you. He loves everyone. And no matter what's in your past, the past can be under the blood, the blood of yeah. Jesus Christ. So if it's under the blood, let's leave it there. Let's leave it there. So the past is under the blood, and let's make sure that your future's under the Bible. Right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff in life I cannot undo. I, I've not personally gone through a divorce, but I, there's a lot of other stuff that I've, I've done. I cannot undo. So I've got to just leave that under the blood. I've just got to, I've, I've repented, I've asked Jesus to forgive me and moved on. But going forward, I don't have to make those same uh, choices, right? So going forward, you can make, make new choices. 
mercy, grace, and righteousness. That's what we want to be about, amen? Mercy and grace and righteousness, God's truth, living for Jesus. So Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 to 32, is continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Jesus' words. He said, You've heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely, he added this word, interesting. A a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she's been unfaithful, in other words, unless she's already broken the covenant of marriage, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who, who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. So when you take, take this right, just face value, G, what Jesus said at face value is not true yet. So the act of divorce is not adultery. Adultery is either in your heart or physically <laughs> being with someone you're not married to. I'm just going to say it nice and euphemistically and softly right there. So when you, a, a, person, a, a person divorces their spouse, that doesn't mean automatically the other person has committed adultery. But Jesus is saying in, in his context that, uh, especially he, uh, as he uses the, the example of a man who divorces his wife, in his day, she was on her own. Like, there were no jobs she could work at. There was no food. There was no home. There was no nothing. And so most likely she was going to be forced to go on, find another relationship, and get married again. And so it's interesting that in Matthew's translation, uh, Matthew's um, uh, version of Jesus' life, he says that um, he causes her to commit adultery. All right? So the act of divorce is going to lead to adultery. But he does say marrying a divorced woman also is committing adultery. So I want to talk a little bit more about this. And so, so much in the Bible, uh, it really helps just to know what is the context, what, what is the meaning, what are, we, what are we talking about here? So in Jesus' day, Jewish people were arguing uh, about whether divorce and remarriage is okay for God's people. It was a thing that was being discussed. And there were a couple of schools of thought, um, and it had to do with how they interpreted Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 to 2. This is what it says in the Law of Moses. Suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. Okay, so just listen to his language. Is this a command? Has a command been made yet? No. Uh, Suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. Having discovered something wrong with her, now pretty much every other translation except the NLT says, having found something indecent in her. It's usually translated indecent. Um, So having discovered something wrong or indecent with her, he writes a document of divorce. In other words, he just writes a little handwritten note, I hereby divorce you, hands it to her, and sends her away from the house. So Moses said, suppose this happens. Suppose this happens. Verse 2, when she leaves his house, she is free to marry another man. Now, why is that significant? Well, for one thing... That was advocating for the cause of women. We can't see it today. Like, we're just in such a different uh, mindset. But if, if, if a man could just go send a, send a woman away in, in, her, in, in, in that day, in the day when uh, Moses was given the law, she would be destitute or go into crime or, or not have a house or a home or anything. And so uh, to be able to say, hey, if, if a guy does this, to a woman, she's free to marry. So uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that's big and that's helpful, but it was, it was interpreted in two different ways. The strict Jews of Jesus' day interpreted this, this command or this section of the law to mean that divorce is only okay if, uh, in this case, if the wife does something truly indecent. In other words, sexual immorality adultery, that kind of thing. So the, the, those that were strict said that's the only reason. And the, the law of Moses doesn't say a ton about divorce. And so they're going by this passage and, and, and saying the principle is that it has to be something really bad. Well, there were also others in Jesus' day not so strict. The Pharisees 
had uh, I- interpreted uh, Moses' words that I just read from Deuteronomy to mean that you have legal freedom to leave your wife to pursue someone else. All you got to do is write her a note. You see, that's a very, those are two very different interpretations. And it was a debate in, not, not, we wouldn't have called it the church in Jesus' day, but in the, among the people of God, it was a big debate, like what's right, what, what's true. So the Pharisees, as they kind of reinterpreted, added their meanings, they, they had written, um, the rabbis have written so much commentary about the Bible, God's word, saying what they think it means. And it just got more and more permissive and lax until there was a joke among the rabbis that if your wife burns dinner when she's cooking you dinner, that's grounds for divorce. Isn't that, wow. Why would they say that? Because they were looking for an excuse. They already had someone else in mind. So they tried to find a way to where where they could find a legal excuse in the law of Moses to say, I'm legal. But you know, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we were, what, two or three messages in to this little series on, on relationships. Jesus has been saying, whoa, don't be going with the letter of the law. What's the spirit of the law? What does God intend? It's not just just stay out of bed with someone that's not you're not married to. It's guard your heart. You see what I mean? Like there is, it was a lot more than just trying to be legal. It was trying to have, be alive to God, love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, as we're talking about in connect groups, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's that's really the bottom line goal that that we're going for. So the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus into taking sides in this debate. And over in Matthew chapter 19, there's a, a, much, uh, a much fuller passage uh, about this interaction. So we can see that a little bit more, what was going on. And they, um, they asked Jesus this question, trying to trap him. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? That was a very common phrase in the debate. That wasn't just a random question. The debate was, some people said, People should be allowed to to divorce for any reason. And others said, no, there's only one reason. So Jesus answers their question with a question, uh, with another question. And I love that about Jesus. (laughs) There's like, we want to know this. And and he says, well, you better think about this first. And so uh, starting down in verse 4, Jesus said, haven't you read the scriptures? And I just love that. So they said, what about this? Can, is it lawful, is it legal in the law of Moses to, uh, to divorce uh, your spouse for any reason, whatever, even if they burn dinner? And Jesus doesn't answer that question. He says, haven't you read the scriptures? Like, if you want to know how to live, read the Bible. Go dig in it for yourself. What does the Bible say? Do you think that, the, like Jesus was saying, in effect, does that sound like the tone of the word of God to you? If someone burns their dinner, you're going to break your covenant? Like, does that sound like the tone? No. So haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied? They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. So they ask him a question about divorce, and he goes back to creation. In the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So Jesus says, uh, let's put a pin in divorce. Let's come back to that in a minute. Let's talk about marriage. It goes all the way back to creation. God made us male and female, and he, he did that for some reasons. So there, today I, I want to bring several principles. And if you're taking notes, I encourage you just to jot them down. But the first principle is this. Marriage is for your good and God's glory. Marriage is for your good and God's glory. So God made male and female, and he made them, can I say this delicately, to fit together, to become one. (laughs) And together, we are the image of God. So I believe, reading between the lines, that God put some of his characteristics only into women and some of his characteristics only into men. I believe God is nurturing and a warrior. I believe he's both. And he said, in order for you to really understand and see the image of God, to see me in you, I got to make you male and female. And he made them 
so that they could come together. And God, God's design for sex and for marriage is one man, one woman for life. That's his design. That's the high standard. And we don't want to lower that standard. That, that, is, that is the standard. And listen to how God wants marriages to be. And my friends are going to be super happy because I alliterated. God wants marriage to be a promise-keeping, procreating, permanent, pleasurable experience. That's how God designed marriage. It's really super, super cool, super beautiful, super amazing and wonderful. And that's what I want for every one of you. Paul said that marriage is supposed to be an illustration of how Jesus loves the church. Wow, I mean, that's deep. Like, God really cares about marriage. And he wants it to reveal some things about him and about his kingdom. Marriage is for your good and for God's glory. And I'm going to go back into that discussion that Jesus is having with the Pharisees trying to trap him down in verse 7. Why did Moses, so Jesus answers them, what God joins, uh, since they're no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Then they come back and they say, well, then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? They ask. They're saying, God said through Moses. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce. He didn't tell everybody to go get divorced, but Moses did permit it only as a concession to your hard hearts. But it was not what God had originally intended. So since some people are jerks to each other, God said, okay, there there are certain circumstances where divorce is okay. It's It's permitted. It's not his choice. It's not his best. But there, there, are, there are times when it happens. Jesus upholds this high standard of marriage, and he stands against a lax, permissive view of divorce. And I would say that we really do have in our country and probably in our world today a lax, permissive view of divorce, like um, Sean Connery's quote that uh, if, you, if you're thinking about a divorce, uh, don't do it because it will be financially bad for you. Oh, oh there's so many, so many things wrong with that, about the marriage part and about the, the divorce. It's, uh, wow. But Jesus warns us to not pursue groundless divorces. So Jesus warns us not to pursue groundless divorces. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11, that two followers of Jesus married to each other ought to be able to be reconciled to each other. That's, wow, just let that hit you. Two, peop- two followers of Jesus ought to be able to be reconciled to each other, to humble yourselves, to lay down your lives for each other, to repent and be reconciled to each other. If you're both believers, you ought to be able to do that. So if one person is being stubborn and not, not helping, come on. Come on. We ought to be able to be reconciled to each other. But that's the ideal, and we are fallen, broken humanity, and we often fall short of the ideal. The ideal would be good for, for your good and for God's glory. Second principle, God intends for your marriage to endure and thrive. And so I just want to say, if you are married right now, God's intention is that, you would, that your relationship would endure forever until death do us part, and that you would thrive, and it would be yeah. beautiful and pleasurable and all those things, procreating if you're younger than us. <laughs> In Malachi chapter 2, verses 10 to 16, it says that marriage is a covenant. It's a binding agreement where each party agrees to fulfill certain obligations. You may have a covenant if you've bought a house. You may have a covenant. Yeah, you can't paint your house certain colors, and you can't build certain structures too close to the road. There, there might be a covenant, and it's, it's an agreement that you enter in. Both, both parties enter in, and they agree to fulfill certain obligations to the other person. For example, in Exodus 21, it says that a husband must make sure that his wife has food, 
clothing, and sexual intimacy. That's the covenant of marriage. So the, the, uh, God puts quite a bit of responsibility on the husbands. Husbands, take care of your wives. And by, by God's grace, you will respond and you will have a great a relationship, a great marriage. Uh, Malachi uh, goes on and talks about covenant, and covenants can be broken. They're not supposed to be broken, but they can be broken. And if they are broken, there are consequences for breaking a covenant. In Malachi, God says through the, this prophet, I hate divorce. Now, you've got to listen to this. He does not say, I hate divorcees. I hate the concept of, of divorce. And for those reasons that I talked about earlier with all the compassion, having gone through it a few times with family members, it's because God says, I hate the pain that it causes you. I don't want you to have that pain. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's not that you are bad if you've been divorced. God says, I hate divorce. That's not my plan. My plan is this. Two people serving God with all their hearts and loving him and loving each other and laying down their lives for each other. That's what I want for you, so I hate anything else. That's what God is saying. You know the pain if you've gone through a divorce, and God wants to spare you that pain. God intends for your marriage to endure and to thrive. A third principle, when God permits divorce, he permits remarriage. Wow, I don't know if I ever thought I would say that. From a pulpit, things, uh, uh, yeah, there, th things have things have changed <laughs> in the church. When God permits divorce, He permits remarriage. There's been a lot of hurt in the church, and I, I too have experienced that through family. When it comes to divorce, but divorce is the freedom to remarry. That's what a divorce means. That. And that marriage is over, and a new one is, is available. So divorce means freedom to remarry. However, we don't always have permission to divorce. That's the rub. If you don't have permission to divorce, then you don't have permission to remarry. So we don't have permission to divorce in any and every situation. Certainly not Casually, Jesus used the word merely. What? You're merely going to write someone a note and kick them out of your house and make them destitute? That's all you're going to do? No. We, a casual divorce, you do not have permission as a follower of God, biblically, to have a casual divorce. I just feel like it. That is not a reason for divorce. Um, it, uh, Jesus taught that if you're divorcing just because you're attracted to someone new, that is, if you want to divorce so that you can marry someone else, and, and in the other Gospels, it's a little more clear. Jesus says, anyone who divorces his spouse and then marries another person. It's like that intent. I just want to break this off, not because there's anything wrong with my marriage, but just because she's cuter, he's richer, whatever. If, some, if, if that's it, you've, then you've already committed adultery in your heart. And in that case, you are not permitted biblically to divorce. Just because you, you feel like someone else is more attractive and you want to just leave for them. Groundless divorce followed by remarriage is adultery. Also, um, it is, we got to keep in mind the covenant. Don't break your marriage covenant. If your spouse has already broken the marriage covenant, you are free to divorce and remarry, but you don't have to. You are free to, but you don't have to. You can choose to be reconciled. That is an option. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 7. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul, one of the early church leaders, he wrote about a fourth of the New Testament. He gave permission to divorce and remarry if your unbelieving spouse deserts you. Okay, so hardliners will say, Jesus said, there's only one reason. And then Paul comes along and says, well, but I'm seeing this issue has come up. And if this happens, it's okay. You're free. That's interesting. Let's, 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 not, let's not go by that too quickly. He gave permission, and that's in 1 Corinthians 7.15. So he was responding to an issue, and uh, it, the early church, people are getting saved. 
everything's changing. And some, some of those spouses were not getting saved, and they left. And Paul said, well, if they leave, you're not bound. You're free to remarry. We are an Assemblies of God church. I don't know if you know that. We're an Assemblies of God church. I love the Assemblies of God. It is a great movement of churches to belong to. And uh, the Assemblies of God, the national office, has an official written position on divorce and remarriage. That's the title, divorce and remarriage. And our official position allows for, for divorce and remarriage in the two situations that are specifically spelled out by Jesus and by Paul. Uh, in the case of a spouse that commits adultery and they break the covenant, or uh, an unbelieving spouse who leaves. So adultery and desertion. But after this, in this long paper, they go through all the biblical, and I, man, I had to condense so much. I have read a lot of pages on this topic, just trying to make sure I understand what does the whole Bible say about it. And at, at the end of the paper, they say, and here's how to apply this. And there's, there's a whole long section for pastors, pastoral application. And they said that when it comes to other ongoing difficult marriage situations, so he, they said, so it's very clear, the, two, the two, two things that are spelled out, that's clear. If uh, your spouse commits adultery or unbelieving spouse deserts you. Okay, great. But it says when it comes to other ongoing difficult marriage situations, such as physical or emotional abuse, Chemical addictions, so addictions to drugs or alcohol, or danger to physical or spiritual health. If those things are ongoing in a marriage, the pastors and the church are to work together. This is the Assemblies of God position. Pastors and the church are to work together and lead people in these situations through applying scriptural principles and prayer. And here's a quote. As they come to decisions consistent with scripture, and their own consciences, consciences. Wow. Thank you. That is not the Assemblies of God position that I heard about when I was five. And I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. Not because we want to be light on divorce, but if someone is slugging their spouse and beating them to a pulp, and it will not stop, and they will not repent. That could be grounds for divorce and freedom to marry. Because divorce is with grounds. That means freedom to remarry with the blessing of God. So I want to stop right here and just, talk, just, just bring a word about abuse. If you are being physically or emotionally abused, abused in some way, get out right now. Get yourself and the kids out. Get to safety. I didn't say get divorced. Just get out of that. Don't stand there and be beaten. Get out and run to your church. The church is not me. The church is not the office. The church is not the stage or the carpet or the buildings or the cameras. The church is the people. And we, we are a refuge. And we want to walk with you and help you. If, if your spouse is spending all the rent and food money on drugs, get help right now. Get help. You need to eat. You need a safe place to live. And come to us. Don't, don't hide and run from the church. We run to the messes. We run right at it. And, and we together will get through this and we'll look at the Bible and we will pray and we will support where, where, where uh, marriages can be reconciled, that's, that's always going to be a first choice. But reconciliation means two people stop doing what they've been doing, <laughs> right? Or because if, they've, if a husband's been beating or the wife's been beating a spouse, they're breaking the terms of the covenant. The covenant is already broken just like adultery would break it. Does that make sense? Now, if your wife has an extra wrinkle... If your husband's not as rich as you hoped, no. You do not have the church's blessing on that divorce, okay? That's going pharisaical. Well, if she burns your dinner, that's grounds. No, 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 no. So that's why it, it is a matter of, of prayer and searching out the Bible before, you, before that happens. But if you're being abused, get out now and get some help. 
and, and let's get through this. Last principle, decisions about divorce should involve your church family. And I was, you can see that segue right from that. Decisions about divorce should involve your church family. Here's the thing. If you are in the middle of a crisis situation, if you are in the middle of a very stressful marriage, most likely you're not equipped, thinking clearly, thinking about the whole Bible and all the ripple effects. You need some help. You need some support. Someone to come alongside with you, aside you and say, uh, just because you didn't, didn't like his shirt, no, that's, that's really not a reason. So let's work this through. Let's see, let's see how, how can we reconcile. You see what I mean? That let's run to the church. Um, and before you just go get a divorce, divorce, we, it feels like it's going to be a pain relief, but it's actually like pouring gas on a fire. It's, it's, it's going to be a lot more pain when you go through it. Uh, so, man, let, let's, let's come to the church. Um, seek the counsel and blessing of your pastors. If you're thinking, oh, my pastors wouldn't bless the reason I have for divorce, then, well, maybe. What does that tell you? <laughs> but uh, if they would, man, what a help and what a support to you it would be to go through, uh, go through it with us. Seek uh, the support of your connect group. Man, if you're going through something, seek the support of your connect group. With the loving support of your church acting in mercy and righteousness, <laughs> that's the way you want to go through these difficulties. Galatians 6.2 says, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. So church, let me just make this clear. Church, the church is the people. So us, church, we, hey, us. We uphold righteousness. We apply biblical principles to all of our decisions, corporate decisions, church decisions, and personal decisions. We, we live and love the Bible. We, we really do. Like, we mean that. So if, if perhaps today I have challenged you, if, you, if you're like a longtime church member like myself, I may have even ticked you off a little bit in this message today. <laughs> Good. Go crack this open. Read every single verse about Bible, about uh, uh, divorce, marriage, remarriage, um, relationships, single. Go read all of that for yourself and, and come to a conclusion and maybe even discuss it with somebody else. So we uphold righteousness and we show the mercy that we would want to have. Those two things. We show the mercy and grace that we would want to receive. We show that. So how do we do that? Through listening, through investing time. So I feel convicted. I mentioned this, I think, on annual business meeting day. And maybe you do too. Sometimes I think I'm too busy. We're too busy to invest the time in someone who needs some time. So then maybe we need to disconnect from some of our things. Maybe we need to not take uh, Jonathan to karate and Kimberly to ballet this week. You know what I mean? Like if that means you can't, you don't have time to pray for somebody. Um, we in invest in a time, counseling, supporting, helping people to reconcile, forgiving. The Pharisees brought to Jesus a woman caught in the act of adultery. And do you remember what he did, his response? It's, the story's in John 8. Uh, Jesus said to the accusers, well, let the one of you who's never sinned throw the first stone. So he's, he's being mercy, like treat her the way you want, want to be treated. That's, that's what he's saying. And to the woman, Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. That's mercy. He said, but go and sin no more. That's righteousness. I love you, I don't condemn you, I don't beat you up, I don't put you down, you're not a second-class citizen, but let's not do that anymore. That is harming yourself. So if you are struggling in your marriage, unless you're in danger, seek to reconcile. If you're in danger, get out. Let's get that taken care of. But if, if not, seek to reconcile two parties, especially if you're both believers, you ought to both be able to lay down your weapons and do the hard work. To reconcile. Keep your marriage covenant the way God keeps his covenant with you. Remember how God keeps his covenant? Be present with your spouse, physically and emotionally. The opposite is being absent. Advocate for your spouse. The opposite is beating down your spouse. Don't do that. Advocate for your spouse. Do Work for the best for your spouse and work for God's purposes in your spouse's life. Uh, help uh, empower your spouse for ministry. Empower your, your spouse for uh, fighting temptation. All those things. And the opposite is working only for your own selfish gain. 
So don't, don't do that. Uphold your covenant. So if, if you're married, then, then do the hard work, do the work, and, uh, and keep good on your covenant. Would you stand to your feet if you're here in the room and online, if you're watching, would you make a place of prayer and let, let's pray. Would you all just bow your heads with me for a moment? I want to pray for you. Such, a, such an intense topic, I know, uh, but uh, it's the word of God. <laughs> let's pray. Lord, I pray for all the married people, Lord. I pray for the husbands and wives. Lord, I pray that you would help them to view their marriage as a covenant. No matter what's happened in the past, from this point on, Help them to view it as a covenant. In Malachi, your word says you witness every marriage covenant. You witness it, Lord. You care about it. So help us, Lord God, in our covenants. Help us to treat it like that, in agreement with obligations and consequences for not treating our spouse in love. Lord, I pray that you'd help those who are having difficulties. And I do understand we have all had difficulties, all of us, even my wife and I, we have all had difficulties. And Lord, I pray you would help us to reconcile, help us to work through it, help us to both love truly and completely, Lord God. Lord, if there's abuse going on in anyone's marriage, verbal, sexual, uh, physical, emotional abuse going on, spiritual abuse, Lord, I pray for the end of abuse right now in Jesus' name. It is sin, and we pull down that stronghold in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for safety and protection for every one of your people, Lord God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed, I just want to ask you, I want to talk to the singles first. If you're a single adult, if you're not, if you're not married, you've just heard this whole message on, on marriage and divorce, and I don't know if your head is spinning or not, but I, I, I just want to ask you this. Is the Holy Spirit convicting you of any attitudes or actions that you've had. Sometimes the Holy Spirit has this way of he's talking to you about something I wasn't even talking to you about. <laughs> but maybe you feel convicted. Maybe your heart is beating like, oh man, I know I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have this attitude or I know I shouldn't have done that. If you are, if you are feeling, if you're single and you're feeling convicted, would you just raise your hand and that would tell me I should pray for you. And uh, I, will, I, I will do that. All right, you can put them down. Uh, are you married? I'm as, asking you the same question. Is the Holy Spirit convicting you of any actions or attitudes that you've had? If so, would you raise your hand? Mine's first. Yes. <laughs> yes, I feel convicted of my own preaching. Yes. Many hands going up. And online, if you're raising your hand, raise it to God. He can see. He can see. If you raised your hand, let's repent. The Holy Spirit doesn't come to condemn. He comes to convict of sin so you can get rid of it and deal with it and repent. So, so let's do that. Let's confess whatever it is that the Lord brought to mind. Let's express sorrow. Let's choose a new mindset. Would you just pray? Pray on your own. If you raised your hand, pray on your own. Lord, I thank you for bringing things to our minds. Lord God, we do repent. We turn the other way from them. Lord, we're sorry for the things we've done that hurt ourselves, you, and others. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would just make us new, renew our minds, Lord God. Help us to choose a new mindset going forward towards relationships, towards uh, singlehood, and towards marriage, towards remarriage, towards divorce, all those things. Lord, we lay down our preconceived ideas and we take up your word. And we choose to follow you, Lord, in Jesus' name. One more, one more invitation, and that is, uh, if, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, I want to invite you to do that. Put your faith in him. How do you do that? Turn from your sin. Turn your life over to God and let him lead you. Turn away from all those things that you do that harm yourself and others and give your life to Jesus. Today, if you'd like to do that, if you're in the room, would you raise your hand and, and, and I'll just pray for you. If you're online, would you raise your hand to God and I'm still going to pray for you too. Yeah, it's so good. I'm so glad to see some hands raised. That's great. That's good. Doing some business with God right now and that is awesome. So let me just coach you in a prayer. Would you just repeat after me, but don't say it to me. Say it to God. Let's pray it to God. And everybody, let's help them out. Let's do it. Let, repeat after me. Jesus, 
I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice in covenant relationship starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, you put your faith in Jesus, we're clapping because we're so excited for you because we know this changes everything. That is awesome. Would you just let me know, and everybody wants to take out your cell phone one more time to support, well, just let me know. If you just prayed that prayer just now, would you text the word restart because you're restarting your life. Restart to that same phone number, 97,000. And that will just let me know, Pastor Garen, I prayed that prayer today, and it matters. It matters to us. We want to pray for you this week in our staff meeting, and we want to support you and just help you any way we can. Man, you guys, thank you so much for being here today. Wow, Pastor Garen, thank you so much for that message. What I love about um, your message today was that you brought the whole counsel of the Word of God. Somehow you managed to get it in in like 20 minutes. So that's so cool. And also, um, we heard the heart of God on marriage. So powerful. Um, if you're new with us today, text GREET to 97000. That lets us meet you, greet you, welcome you into our church family. Um, also, right after the service today, we have connect groups, so um, make sure you make your way to your connect groups, and for those on Wednesday, we also have connect groups um, for you as well, and if you're not in a connect group, I really want to encourage you to join a connect group. This is how we do life together. We pray for each other. We help each other. We can't do this alone. We're in it together, amen? Amen. If you're watching online, please subscribe to our channel, like our videos. This helps the message get out, helps other people find us online. And uh, the last thing is we have these great um, invite cards for our Easter service. They're out in the lobby, I think on a, um, a table. Make sure you grab as many of you, as many as you can on your way out. Invite your friends, your neighbors, your family members to our Easter service that's coming up in just a few weeks. This is going to be a powerful time of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus together. Can't wait to see you guys next week online and right here in person. Have a wonderful day.